Yeah, so um, I'll be giving this a presentation about data pipelines with Postgres and Kafka. Uh, I gave the same presentation earlier, a month ago, in PGCon uh, EU. Uh, but uh, this time around, it was actually supposed to be uh, presented by my colleague, but apparently uh, he fell sick earlier today, so I'm covering for him. So uh, the agenda for the actual talk is uh, I'm going to be talking about the data pipelines, uh, some uh, bits about Kafka and how does it work and the uh, uh, related concepts. Then how do you use Kafka and Postgres together? A uh, word about influx somewhere in between. And then uh, how do you use Kafka for data processing uh, of the data? The data examples are mostly going to be covering are actually from real life uh, events about time series data and their manipulation. A uh, word about me, I'm a co-founder at Ivan. Uh, I'm also a Postgres aficionado, have been using Postgres for ages and uh, have contributed to uh, multiple different uh, open source projects around it. Uh, yeah, so a word about us. Uh, we're an, uh, a database as service startup. Uh, we were founded a couple of years ago. Uh, we currently serve customers in six different public clouds, have eight different uh, databases as a service, and our <coughs> customers range from small Czech aquarium stores to huge companies like Toyota and Comcast. Uh, we've been uh, uh, basically uh, operational and uh, selling our uh, services since early 2016. Uh, then a word about data pipelines. The uh, Wikipedia definition for this is pipeline is a set of data processing elements connected in a series where the output of one element is the input of the next one. The elements of a pipeline are often executed in parallel or in time slice fashion. The name pipeline comes from an, a rough analogy with physical plumbing. So now that we've got the definition out of the way, you know, you know what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, but anyway, modern data pipelines are basically used to ingest uh, huge uh, volumes of data. For example, Netflix claims that they're actually processing 2 trillion messages in their Kafka clusters a day, which uh, roughly equates to 3 petabytes of data every given day of the year. So uh, people are using data pipelines at huge volumes. Uh, also, real-time processing data pipelines these days, which are using streaming as their basis, are more or less replacing old-style ETL uh, uh, processes from different firms. So uh, previously, you used to have, let's say, a nightly batch where you dumped your whole database uh, and then actually put it into a reporting database and did prob prob probably some sort of ETL on it, so extraction, transformation, or uh, basically touch the data up somehow so that it would actually fit into your reporting database. But these days, actually, people would rather process the data in a streaming fashion and hopefully in real time. So uh, people aren't really willing to wait for, uh, let's say, 24 hours to get a response saying, how many books did we sell today? They actually want to know it by the second. And the same thing applies. Let's say you're a gaming company. Uh, you actually want to have high scores that are updated, let's say, every couple of seconds or something. You definitely don't want them to be be lagging behind for a day. Uh, anyway, common components of a data pipeline. Um, there's a, usually a component that ingests data, and usually this is the thing that actually has to um, survive firehose style data bursts. So basically, uh, lots and lots of data coming in. Then you typically do some sort of filtering on it. So uh, let's say you have data that you know that I, let's say you are, uh, for example, you have an HTTP access log. You're only interested in uh, HTTP access logs that uh, have a 200 uh, as the uh, uh, status code uh, for it. Uh, you're not interested in the 404s or 300 series errors. You're just interested in the 200s. You'd be filtering at this point. Then there's a, you usually do some sort of processing because what's the point of getting the data if you're not actually doing anything with it? So uh, then this could be that you are calculating how many requests a day you got or whatnot. Then typically after the fact, you actually want to query the data somehow. Uh, it's usually neat that you actually have the data somewhere, but you actually will probably want to actually query it some at some point later in the day. And then eventually uh, you probably actually want to dump it somewhere. So if some, for some unforeseen reason you actually are interested in seeing it, uh, let's say six months from now, you actually don't need to keep it in your actual day-to-day -day databases, but you actually have some place where you uh, push the data to. And then because somebody will eventually come up with a great idea of uh, 
uh, how to analyze the data better the next time around, you probably need to be able to reprocess the data again and again. And about the requirements for these, uh, like scalability, like I mentioned, uh, so there are firms that are running huge data pipeline platforms. Uh, there are firms that are doing this on a small scale, and we try to cater to everything in between. Uh, then because of these uh, data volumes, uh, you typically want the system to be available all the time. It's not usually okay if it goes down for a couple hours or days. Uh, you probably actually want to keep it running at all times. Also, uh, for example, one of our customers, uh, uh, like Comcast, they actually were fairly adamant on having really low latency for their data processing pipeline. So we actually had to do uh, some tweaking there to actually get the best performance available. And then uh, these data pipelines, uh, they typically come with client libraries for different languages and operating systems. So you probably want to, uh, it to support whatever is the set of uh, applications or operating systems or uh, like programming languages that you need to support. So let's say you're a Java house, you want the thing to support Java. Uh, this is like the traditional data flow model. Uh, there's clients on the top uh, side of the picture, and then there's some sort of a, a web app uh, or some other sort of a service that basically pros the data and eventually the data ends up uh, going into some sort of a database. Uh, but then usually the problems come along when because people start doing uh, this sort of example. So here's this tiny thing that I want to go and grab some data from, uh, uh, let's say, HTTP API. And then I want to run it against some uh, Python code so I can filter the data somehow. And then eventually you push it to PSQL so it'll actually get inserted into the database that you're actually talking to. Uh, but eventually you start getting pictures like this. So if you uh, saw this picture, which is kind of simple, this is basically the same picture taken six months later or 12 months later. So uh, typically uh, these uh, things don't get simpler over time. You keep on adding these curl and funny one-off scripts uh, until uh, things actually start hurting. And at this point, it's going to be very hard for you to develop new software because you don't really have any clear-cut interface between the systems. They basically are completely uh, accessing one another's data without any constraints. So basically you can have whatever sort of data coming in from whichever direction and if you're doing it diligently maybe you can still handle it but it's still getting to be uh, quite a bit of things that you actually need to keep in mind whenever you're touching any component within this diagram. Um, so a word about Apache Kafka. It's an open source project that came out of uh, LinkedIn. Uh, it's basically meant for streaming uh, data. But uh, how many of you are aware of what Apache Kafka is? Just so. Okay, so fair few of you. Uh, it's a, a top level Apache project and that comes with the same uh, voting things on every release that every other Apache project does for amusement reasons. But uh, then uh, it's also these days used by lots of different companies. So the Airbnbs and Comcast of the world are all using uh, Apache Kafka for a lot of processing needs. So you can basically pick up any Fortune 500 firm and they're definitely using Kafka today. Uh, the good thing about Kafka is that it actually um, is able to scale at any given, uh, to pretty much any given size. But the revolutionary thing about Kafka was actually that they, uh, if you have a historical message queue, you typically had a sender that uh, knew who it wanted to send a message to. But Kafka actually inverted this. So you actually, the guys who are actually writing the messages into Kafka don't know who's going to be eventually reading this. So actually by removing this coupling between the re uh, readers and the writers, uh, you basically allow any kind of new use cases to come up after the fact. Because let's say you were using something like RabbitMQ previously, you sent a message to let's say a group uh, of services, but let's say somebody came up with a new use case for analyzing data. Uh, how would you actually get to do that? You'd probably have to configure so that the senders are sending it to the new place as well. In the case of Kafka, uh, anybody can read any data as long as the access control lists allow it, allowing lots of different new use cases for processing. Uh, 
This is the ideal Kafka-centric uh, data flow model. It's uh, sort of beautiful. Uh, nobody really gets it to be uh, this centric, but uh, this is the idea that the, there would be the one thing that everybody talks to. Uh, so instead of all services talking to each other directly, they'd be using Kafka to do that. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, let's say, the uh, thing where people uh, yearn to be, uh, but it's really more like the spaghetti thing still, but this is what people would like to have. Uh, basically having Kafka uh, and basically having all interactions happen through Kafka with well-defined interfaces between data and then having the data be structured in some sort of message formats. Uh, word about Kafka concepts. So in Kafka when you're writing uh, uh, there, you're writing to a topic. Uh, it's fairly analogous to a PostgreSQL table if you will. So basically uh, it is uh, an entity where you can write data to, uh, which is further split to partitions, so you can have unlimited partitions or a very high number of partitions. Basically the partitions are the unit of a concurrency, so if you have um, uh, let's say five readers, you need to have at least five partitions, so Kafka can act actually push the data to all those five, so they're not processing the same messages again. Uh, and you can actually benefit out of having five readers. Uh, the other thing about Kafka, it's an immutable log, so, log. so you can also think of it as a log file. So you sequentially write to it and then you can just read back from it and you basically uh, have an offset of where you're reading from. Basically because it's a sequential immutable log, it's also really, really fast to write into because it doesn't really have much of any sort of a structure beyond that. It's just an immutable log that you can basically keep on writing at really high speeds. Uh, the thing that I was alluding to earlier about the uh, decoupling between producers, which are the guys who are writing it in Kafka terms, and the consumers, is uh, the idea is that uh, we can, ha uh, when the producers write stuff to, let's say, this logs topic, uh, what happens is that they just write to it. There is nobody reading at this point. But let's say we come up with a use case that I want to read logs because I want to copy them to Elasticsearch, for example. That would be a one consumer group. But then let's say six months later on, somebody actually comes with an idea that I would like to process the, the, all the data in the logs topic again. And you just create a new consumer uh, and that, that, that just reads through the data. You can also search by time between the topics. So let's say you don't just want to search, I want to go to offset four to the fourth message in the topic. You can just say that, oh, can, you, can I please search to uh, 2018, uh, January 1st. And then you can start reading and reprocessing all your data from that point onwards. Uh, some of the benefits of using Apache Kafka, why it's this popular these days, is that it supports real-time streaming or something close to that. So you can get the uh, latencies below 10 milliseconds with that. It's not really a hard real-time, but it is fast enough for most use cases. Uh, you can also scale it to billions of messages a day. So like I mentioned earlier, uh, Netflix says that they're currently pushing a couple of trillion messages a day. So 2,000 billion messages a day. They have like 3,000 nodes of Kafka running. So they have quite a few machines. And of course, I'm sure they have tons and tons of machines actually doing the processing, the consumers and producers. But basically, every time you're uh, browsing in Netflix, like looking for a movie to watch, they're basically recording all, where did your uh, mouse hover over, which title, and for how long are you interested in, I don't know, uh, westerns or in sci-fi movies or whatnot. And they basically are collecting all this data and they're actually processing a real-time uh, profile of you. What are you interested in? So uh, this guy watched some soap uh, opera uh, sort of thing. So he's only interested in that sort of thing in the future. Or your kids were watching Netflix. Uh, so you get suggestions for uh, some cartoons or whatnot. Uh, also, it also supports out of the box uh, rack and data center aware replication. So uh, typically uh, in the case of Kafka, the only persistence you have for messages is coming out of replication. So let's say you, a machine dies, you probably want there to be another replica of the uh, data. So typically people use either replication factor two or three or higher. But uh, typically people will just pick something like three and just go with that. Uh, also, uh, 
that supports things like cross-region replication. We have customers uh, running Kafka in South America and actually uh, but like sending all their data to Europe. And basically you can have uh, um, Kafka clusters around the world and you can have Kafka clusters that do ingestion in some continent X and then moving that data somewhere else for later processing. That sort of thing is completely commonplace when you're using Kafka at scale. And Anyway, like I mentioned earlier, we, it's the, the huge paradigm shift here is that this decouples the message consumption and producing. So at the time when you're creating the message, writing it, you don't have to know who's going to eventually be processing it. So you can, after the fact, come like uh, six months down the road, come up with a new idea and just reprocess the message because they're not completely uh, independent from each other. Uh, the client libraries are uh, available in pretty much any language. In some languages, they're worse than others. Node is uh, particularly uh, had challenging clients. It, it has gotten better, but still uh, uh, slightly off. In Python, there's fairly good support. Java has the native uh, Kafka consumer and producer libraries, so that has fairly excellent support. And in C, there's a thing called librd Kafka that is uh, fairly well supported by Confluent. Uh, some downsides of using Kafka is that it actually relies on Zookeeper. So uh, how many of you have actually had to maintain Zookeeper clusters? How many of you have enjoyed maintaining a Zookeeper <laughs> cluster? Okay, Heike back there doesn't count. He's our CTO and he loves that sort of thing. <laughs> but uh, it depends on Zookeeper. It's a hard dependency. You can't really easily run it without it. And uh, then there are things that um, it actually doesn't take care of. Um, so let's say you are uh, you keep on adding new machines. It doesn't automatically take care of rebalancing your data. There are tools that do this for you, but there are extra uh, tools outside of Kafka itself. So if you actually want to balance the load between Kafka broker nodes, you have to have some way of doing it. And then, uh, especially historically, uh, Kafka uh, has had its share of stability issues. It has gotten much better over time, but uh, uh, especially, let's say, a couple of years ago when we uh, started offering it, it was um, fairly rough around the edges. Uh, some would say that it still is, but uh, it's much better than it used to be back then. Uh, if uh, you don't want to deal with the hassle, consider using a managed Kafka service like ours or Confluence. Uh, it'll save you a lot of time. You can, of course, run this yourself, but then you get to uh, keep the Zookeeper problems by yourself. Uh, anyway, a word about databases in the pipeline. Uh, yeah, so they usually have this fairly similar requirements that as uh, the, the ones I presented for Kafka in the earlier slides. Uh, they need to be scalable. You probably want to be able to rely on them, and you probably need to have some sort of platform support for the languages and or operating systems or environments that you're running it in. Postgres is usually a fairly good choice for this. It's really robust. Uh, it's very hard to break Postgres. Uh, you can do it, but it's usually still standing when almost all the other components in your data pipeline have fallen over. So uh, Postgres is fairly reliant, reliable. It's also really easy to just run arbitrary queries on your data. So uh, let's say you're pushing the data to something like Cassandra, uh, but like it's not that easy to do arbitrary queries over it in the data. With Postgres, you can just create arbitrary indexes and you can do whatever sort of joins between the data easily. And this is, by the way, the explain support that Postgres has. It actually tells you how it's going to run a query. Uh, that is very, very useful uh, for lots of things when you are wondering why is my query slow? Because not all the competing databases have anything that is close to as usable as Postgres explain support. Uh, the downside of using something like Postgres is actually that it has limited horizontal scalability. So let's say your data doesn't fit into a single machine. Uh, that's usually a problem. Of course, hardware has gotten better over time. So these days, it's not uncommon to see, let's say, 5 to 10 terabyte uh, databases somewhere around, which used to be like in the realm of fantasy 10 years ago. Uh, or basically, you did really custom hardware that cost in the millions. Uh, but these days, 10 terabyte databases are commonplace in different firms. Uh, if you are running something like a Kafka-centric data flow model with Postgres, so basically you're pushing all the data from the application layer uh, into Kafka, and then you're uh, 
ingesting it into a, a Postgres, you might have a separate OLTP cluster for your real-time needs. Then you might have a, a separate uh, cluster to actually handle the metrics. Let's say you have a time series data that you want to push in. Uh, Postgres can cater to a lot of different use cases. It's not just OLTP, it's not just warehousing. You can actually do lots of different things for lots of different data types with it. Here's an example of uh, what would it take if you were running Influx Data's Telegraph. Uh, it's basically a metrics collection agent for those of you who haven't uh, seen it before. It's basically a way of collecting metrics like CPU or disk usage metrics from a uh, VM and pushing it uh, to an output of your choice. Uh, it has a really large uh, selection of outputs that you can push data to. It supports, for example, Kafka, it supports Postgres, it supports lots of different other uh, systems, like uh, in this case it supports InfluxDB, for example. So. This allows you to uh, collect the data. This is just an example of a data pipeline where we're collecting uh, metrics. Uh, it's been the data, the metrics could actually be coming directly from something like uh, phones or whatnot. But in this example of mine, our data pipeline basically uh, consists of uh, getting data from uh, uh, Telegraph itself. Uh, then you typically would have uh, something that sends the data to Apache Kafka. And then you would have another container or uh, possibly a Kafka Streams application or a Kafka Connect application. For those of you who don't know, Kafka Connect is a Kafka service which uh, allows you to have uh, basically uh, ingest data from a source and then send it somewhere else. So this is really useful if you want to, let's say, read data from Postgres and you want to send it to, let's say, Elasticsearch or some other service, like Amazon S3, for example. There's a Kafka Connect connector ready to do this sort of thing out of the box. But in this example of ours, we're using Telegraph to actually do the sending to uh, InfluxDB. Uh, a word about InfluxDB in this example. This is actually uh, fairly close to what we ha have as a like a time series the data pipeline that we've used within Ivan. Uh, InfluxDB is basically based on the Gorilla paper for compression. It compresses time series data really efficiently, uh, but uh, it's also uh, when, because the compression is really efficient. It's also disk footprint is really small. It's also fairly fast and it scales fairly well. Unfortunately, it doesn't have things like HA. Uh, it used to have a rudimentary way of doing a high availability, but they uh, removed it from the open source version and put it in the proprietary version that they sell. And that kind of uh, limits its, some of its use cases. It also has a, a bit of an unpredictable memory usage pattern. So let's say you are doing select star from foo limit one. It doesn't actually return one row as you'd think. It actually materialized that whole foo into memory and then it takes the one row out of it. So let's say your uh, table foo is, I don't know, a terabyte. You had better have at least one terabyte of memory to get that one row. So these things are not easy to predict and it has no support whatsoever for things like explain. So let's say you wanted to know what is it gonna do, it's gonna materialize this whole uh, return set into memory and then return one row. Uh, it won't tell you that. These are things that you just need to know and there are sharp edges everywhere. Uh, it also uh, is uh, switching to a new, uh, it has it in a SQL-like language that it supports now, but it's uh, changing to something different soon. And it uh, has a, a different barrier for entry again because it's going to be using a different language. This is another way of doing the same thing. So instead of uh, pushing the data uh, from whichever devices over Kafka to InfluxDB, which is a time series database, you can actually do the same thing with just using Postgres. So you'd basically have one less component if you already have a Postgres running somewhere. So why take another dependency into management and maintenance if you could just get rid of it? So uh, there's a, uh, uh, this, um, there have historically been multiple ways of doing uh, storing the time series data in Postgres. Uh, people have been using PG Partman and that sort of thing to do uh, uh, partitioning so you can actually store and ingest uh, data at great speeds. These days there is also a fairly commonly used uh, 
extension called Timescale DB, which basically uh, does Postgres partitioning and uh, some. Uh, it has also some uh, time series uh, queries for putting time into buckets and that sort of thing. Uh, but basically, Postgres has the same functionality as you would have in a time series specific database. In addition to being a really good relational database, you can actually put time series data there as well. So Postgres is really versatile. You can actually do lots and lots of different things in different domains with the same thing. Uh, Postgres, unlike the InfluxDB, which I mentioned earlier, has support for HA. But these days, uh, since 9.0, you've been able to use streaming replication, and it's been fairly easy to set up uh, HA around that. Uh, it has also a great ecosystem of tools around it. So there's plenty of different graphical user interface if you want to do uh, queries against Postgres. And basically, uh, there's also uh, tons and tons of people who know how to use this and who you can hire to your company if you actually need somebody to know something about Postgres. I mean, here we are, there's 50 people uh, here in a Postgres Helsinki meetup. Uh, how many people are there in a more specific database uh, vendors event? There probably isn't one in Helsinki, for example. The other nice thing about, by the way, using something like Postgres is since the command line tools, for example, are way superior um, to many other products, is that, for example, this is a real example I'm showing here. Uh, so uh, we ha have this open source backup daemon for Postgres called PG Horde that actually compresses and encrypts your backups and puts them into object store. And uh, we were wondering what's the uh, compression ratio if you're using, uh, it supports different compression algorithms, so it was things like Snappy and LZMA. Uh, we were wondering what's the uh, uh, compression ratio. And uh, uh, when we were using InfluxDB, we actually didn't know that we were collecting this already. This has been in PG Horde for a couple of years now, and we supported collecting the compression ratio for ages. Uh, we didn't really know because InfluxDB, in InfluxDB it's really hard to just browse through your metrics. What kind of sort of data do I have there? So uh, we didn't actually know that we had the data already. But when we actually uh, started pushing the same data to TimescaleDB Postgres, uh, we actually just looked at the list of tables in P uh, PSQL and oh, there's this thing called uh, PG Horde compressed size ratio. Ah, okay. So now we know uh, what the compression ratios are for different algorithms in our client base. Uh, because we were really uh, just uh, surprised that we actually were already collecting the data that we were looking for. But we had no idea because in InfluxDB, browsing your, your data is really not that simple. Uh, then a word about SQL. Uh, it's, it was originally invented in the 70s and it's really, really popular. Even these NoSQL databases basically uh, um, started uh, pretty much all of them supporting SQL in one form or another. Uh, MongoDB is still an exception, but a, a lot of the others like Cassandra, who, which started out having some sort of a different uh, way of accessing the data, pretty much all have some sort of a SQL support these days. Uh, a lot of people are criticizing it, but the, the skills that you use when you're using SQL are usually transferable to something else. So let's say you're using Postgres today. Some of these skills are transferable uh, to Cassandra, not that many because the data model is different, but at least the idea, you can read the query. What, what is it doing even if you're reading a Cassandra query? But the, the, also the uh, skills that you develop when you're actually learning SQL, you can develop, also transfer to other uh, RDBMSs like, uh, Post, uh, like My MySQL or or Oracle or others like uh, that. Also, now you can do actually SQL over Kafka, which is why we have the slide. So uh, in Kafka, when you're storing data in a Kafka topic, uh, there's a fairly new thing called KSQL, uh, which allows you to uh, write SQL uh, against your Kafka topic. So let's say you have, uh, you're writing messages into Kafka that have three fields in the message, so path, user ID, and status. You can actually search that, but you can also do more complex things than this. So let's say uh, you would be storing, let's say, an integer or something. You could just sum them up. So some uh, field A to B. And then basically the end result of this uh, processing basically would uh, be stored in another Kafka topic. But the reason why this is interesting is that historically when you've actually been using Kafka, you've had to actually write some code uh, that actually consumes the data from Kafka and then does some sort of processing on it and then pushes the, the results back. Uh, 
This is basically, uh, I mean, SQL is still coding and programming as such, but it uh, has a way lower barrier of entry than actually somebody starting to write Python or Java or Node or whatnot. So this is something you can uh, give to a lot of other people to actually uh, run queries against. Uh, yeah, anyway, KSQL, it's early days for it, but it is simply going places and it, it really helps that it actually uh, uh, supports SQL. You can also do things like window queries with it, so it supports complex SQL even. Uh, these queries that you're running in KSQL, it has two different modes. One is basically uh, in real time uh, returning a subset of data. This isn't that interesting except when you're browsing through your topic data in Kafka. You want to, let's give me the first hundred rows in the topic. That's uh, fine for when you're browsing the stuff. But the really interesting thing is that when you have a continuous query, so the, the query that we had on the previous page, like this select path user ID status from clickstream where status is above four so in this example we have a click stream where uh, you have HTTP status code so 200 okay we have for the request that succeeded and everything above 400 is some sort of an issue uh, but this stream that you're creating KSQL is processing the data in real time to another topic so if you want real-time data processing in Kafka you can just write a SQL uh, statement to do it now uh, this, it has been possible to do this uh, otherwise, but it is much simpler uh, to do it this way than it has been in the past. Uh, then if you have um, things like Kafka Connect that I or alluded to earlier, basically it is a framework for um, uh, in Kafka to ha have things that actually read data from somewhere. Basically there's a source adapter for pretty much, a uh, source connector for pretty much any database service. So you could have a source that is Twitter feeds, for example. So people are reading Twitter feeds in directly into Kafka with Kafka Connect. Then they have a sync, which is where uh, the data is pushed to. And those syncs could uh, support things like Amazon S3 if you want to put the data into object store. Uh, they uh, could be things where you push data into Postgres. That is a fairly common way. Uh, you can also have sources and that actually read data from Postgres so with, let's say, things like Debezim, which actually uses Postgres logical replication to replicate data in real time as you're writing it into Postgres and pushing it into a Kafka topic. These sort of things are easily possible to, with tools from the Kafka ecosystem. Yeah, the, uh, but anyway, the idea behind the Kafka Connect connector is that instead of everyone writing their own application to do this, because you've always been able to do this programmatically yourself, to uh, write an application that reads from a database and writes it to another uh, place, you've been always able to do this. But the idea behind this is that you don't actually have to write code yourself anymore. So you can just uh, set up a configuration file and say, read the data from Postgres, write it to Elasticsearch or any uh, combination of different services that you can imagine. Uh, this is an example of what uh, your uh, clickstream could be like. So let's say you have clients that are phones or whatnot. They uh, do HTTP requests to the uh, uh, application servers that, that were in the original picture at the top. Uh, they keep on writing messages there. Then with KSQL, we uh, reprocess the click stream. So we actually get another topic called errors. So basically we have at this point processed and filtered all the error, uh, like all the HTTP access requests that you've done uh, to a separate topic. So now you can actually just read a topic that has only the errors that you're actually having in your HTTP servers. If you're doing something like alerting, this would be really useful to see, like uh, you're always getting a 403 for path X or whatnot, but basically you can do all of this with just uh, writing uh, configuration or SQL. You don't have to write any Python, Java, Node or whatnot code. And in the end, uh, this errors thing, yeah, there's a Kafka connector called JDBC sync, which allows you to insert the data from a Kafka topic to a Postgres uh, table or a Postgres database. So in this uh, example, uh, we are actually uh, pushing all the data that we process from the clients, the HTTP errors, they are ending up in a Postgres cluster as a table where uh, you have these rows like path, user ID and status uh, 
uh, as being the, uh, the columns in the table. So you can actually query this in Postgres and whatever you want to do in your Postgres database, you can do this also in real time. So let's say you have a service where you have hundreds of uh, HTTP web servers that are getting error logs. You can do this sort of real time data pipelines easily without writing a single line of code. Well, uh, if you don't count SQL to be in code, but uh, it's still code, but it's a um, slightly easier sort of code. Yeah, so uh, summary of uh, this data pipeline thing. So Kafka is a fairly powerful uh, component that allows you to have a, a nicely drawn Kafka-centric architecture. So instead of all servers talking to each other, you can come up with uh, having Kafka sit at the center of the picture and then basically everybody talking to Kafka. And so instead of everybody talking directly or reading directly from each other's databases, you have a nice separation between the different components in your system. Uh, Postgres is a really robust RDBMS, so it really uh, has been developed for uh, 20 plus years and it works really well. So these days uh, nobody is picking something like Oracle as the database, so where if you're starting up a firm, nobody's going to pay 30 plus K uh, for a new firm's database. So people are picking Postgres. Postgres simply just works. And Kafka and Postgres are used in a lot of firms to ingest billions and billions of messages a day. And a word about SQL, SQL is mostly here to stay. Uh, just go ahead and learn it. It will help you later in life. Any questions? Does it do batch inserting? Like Say I'm using C store or some analytics database with col columnar store. I don't want to insert the values one by one, let's say they uh, every ten seconds. Uh, it depends on the thing. Uh, if you're um Using the, the Telegraph thing that I mentioned, instead of using Kafka Connect, it actually supports batching. It was written by our CEO to support for that. Uh, we actually need it for a demo in another conference. So we actually wrote the code for that, but it's open source, so feel free to use it. It uses batching. Uh, but yeah, there are other ways of uh, doing it. Uh, but the JDBC driver actually does it row by row. So it's not using batching, the example I had. So the connector is used by sure. Uh Sorry? Uh, yeah, there, there's really no need why it could not do batching. There, there are some, um, like uh, the Kafka Connect framework doesn't really uh, like doing things in batches. Uh, it, uh, it's more about actually handling a single message at a time. But there, you could still make it do things in batches if you uh, got around it, it things. It depends on the connectors. The Elasticsearch connectors, for example, do batching things as well. It's, yeah. it's a framework. It doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't, can can. but it has some philosophical uh, <laughs> uh, points of view on how you should be doing things. Okay. Uh, one question, how does Kafka store the data on a node? On a disk, it's uh, like I said, immutable log. So it's basically stored as is in a log file. It also keeps a say like a time index next to it in newer versions of Kafka. So uh, it basically knows that at 3 o'clock on uh, Friday, the 13th of December, uh, it, you're at offset X. So it basically keeps an offset to time mapping uh, on the side. But it's basically an immutable log that doesn't have almost any structure to it. It uh, has very low overhead. And it's written sequentially, so it's really fast on almost all hardware. Uh, Do you guys offer TimescaleDB as a service yet? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do. Uh, do you have transactions supporting Kafka? Uh, Heike, do you want to answer? Do we, uh, <laughs> does Kafka have transaction support? <laughs> Uh, there, there are some transaction support, but it's not uh, as comprehensive as if you were using you things like. Your bank, bank through Kafka. A lot of banks are using Kafka. Uh, even some of our customers are banks. It's Sorry. Something that there's like not guarantees that things won't disappear. Uh, yeah, like basically in Kafka, when you're committing a message, uh, you can basically say that I want this to be at least. Um, well, actually, it's not that. You can basically configure it so that you get, let's say, three acknowledgments that the data is on disk, uh, for example, before you actually say that it's done. Uh, there are ways of getting as many acknowledgments as you want, or you can just uh, fire and forget and hope the data is there. It's mostly there. But uh, 
that's one option. It depends a little bit on the pattern. There was, uh, I had a pleasure to visit Kafka Summit just now. There was, uh, Capital One was giving a good keynote there on how they use Kafka in a kind of uh, financial uh, um, production flows. Yeah, but then, like, Pretty much all huge banks are using Kafka these days, so it's uh, trustworthy enough for that sort of thing. Of course, it's only money, so hey. Uh, well, they're using it for something, so. Uh, uh, but yeah, there are people using it for different use cases, even with money involved. Maybe one comment regarding, back, uh, regarding the comparison to different messaging systems or uh, hmm. how they subscribe systems. Hmm. Some. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? I have very limited uh, experience of Kafka. What, what are the kind of limitations on, it, on its use? Like, is it still efficient if the, the events that come in are relatively large and then you want to make some uh, By default, the, me uh, the message size limit is one meg, uh, but uh, you can basically uh, configure that to be whatever. Uh, it's not meant for having large blobs in it, but the, like one meg is still fine. But the, the, you don't want to put gigabytes of files into it or something like that. There's no, uh, it's not the place to put uh, that sort of data into it. I would say that there is a similar problem that maybe you could use with Postgres is that you have the metadata in form that you can access and do another type of queries, and then that points to some object storage for the large blobs or. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to use Postgres for your file system either. I mean, you can put blobs into it uh, up to X gigs, but you, um, it's not really meant for that. File systems are much better at handling files. Uh, Kafka is actually agnostic towards, it's basically binary blob, so you serialize it in any which way you want. So typ people typically use things like JSON or Avro or Protobufs or uh, something like that. But you get to basically put anything there, it's really uh, whatever data you wish. But a lot of people like see, uh, JSON, for example, internally we, we use a Kafka-centric architecture ourselves. We use JSON pretty much exclusively. Yeah, there is a thing called schema registry in the Kafka world, which basically says that it's basically um, you're sending a topic into messages of type X to a topic, and it has these four fields, so two integers and two strings or whatnot. And then basically when you're reading it back, uh, the schema re registry, uh, you can say that, okay, it's message version X, it should have two integers and two strings in it. And then you can basically uh, get validation for the data. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.